Uh, I consider it a great honor to receive the Harvey Prize, and I want to thank all those many people right here who have been involved in this, in granting me this honor. I also want to especially thank my wife of 50 years, who has supported me in good and bad times, and without her, I don't think I would be here. The citation refers to the ability of laser light forces to manipulate small particles and to the invention of a device called optical tweezers. Both of these had truly revolutionary effects on atoms and biological physics. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of this work from its origins 30 years ago up to the present time. Work on laser tweezers and laser manipulation started when I asked the simple question, was it possible to move small particles by pushing on them with, la with a laser light beam? It is well known that light carries energy, which gives rise to heat when it's absorbed. For instance, when you sit in the sunlight, okay? Light can be considered as made up of small moving particles called photons, which also can exert forces on small particles. However, for ordinary light beams, this force is very small. One isn't conscious of any force when you step out into the sun, for example. The situation is very different if one uses a very pure light source, like a laser. In that case, the light intensity on small particles placed at the beam focus can be made very high, even with a very modest laser power. If one shines such a beam on a small glass sphere, for example, placed in water, one finds that it drives the particles through water at a good speed of some tens of diameters a second in agreement with simple calculations, okay? So the experiment works. One can indeed strongly push small particles with laser light in the direction of the light beam. At the same time, I noticed that there was another unexplained force, a force component, pulling particles into the high intensity of the light beam, okay, as it moved along. In fact, it even trapped them. You move the beam, the particles would follow. This force comes about from the strong gradient in light intensity that can occur with laser beams, okay? Remarkably, I, I say, this makes it possible to physically trap a small particle at the focal point of a strongly focused laser beam. This effect is almost like science fiction to me to this day. One can just focus a laser beam on a transparent sphere. You can trap it, you can pick it up, you can move it around, you can put it down. And for that obvious reason that you can do all these things, it's just called, it's called laser tweezers. Tweezers work for a variety of transparent particles. Sizes from a thousandth of a centimeter all the way down to sizes of molecules and even atoms. Tweezers even works for biological particles, as we shall see. That is a super su surprise. Trapping was of atoms was proposed in 1970. That's over 30 years ago. At the time of the discovery of the first optical trap on transparent spheres. So it took a wild guess. You can trap small spheres. An atom is a little bit of dielectric. It's made up of, uh, the glass is made up of atoms. Why not trap an atom too? It took until 1986 to demonstrate the first trapping of atoms by tweezers. It was necessary to first figure out how to generate strong optical fo the forces needed for optical tweezers and how to cool atoms, starting as an atomic beam with a temperature over 1,000 degrees Kelvin from an oven down to a, by a factor of 10 to the seventh to a few hundredths of a micro Kelvin. That was done in two steps. The first cooling to one degree Kelvin was by an opposing optical beam, okay? You bring the atoms to a stop. 
They were at a temperature at that point of one degree Kelvin. And then you have to have a further optical damping using a technique called optical molasses. This first trapping of atoms by uh, Steve Chu, John Bjorkholm, and myself landed us on the first page of the New York Times on Sunday, okay? This development led to an explosion of activity by atomic physicists using trapped cold atoms. Subsequently, Chu went to Stanford, Bjorkholm at Bell Labs went off, did optical lithography, and I was left with my technician playing with little spheres, okay? Chu took all the equipment for trapping uh, atoms with him, over a million dollars. He also inher inherited more than a million dollars of, of uh, Hench's uh, 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 famous atomic physicist who left to Stanford, went back to uh, Germany, so he was rich. But Chu and his students went on to improve the accuracy of atomic clocks with cold atoms and uh, measure gravity by a, a greatly improved factor. Uh, and he also, uh, they used um, uh, optical inter interferometers which gave them increased accuracy. Phillips at NBS, National Bureau of Standards at that time, he's the guy who slowed the atoms up to, uh, to one degree Kelvin. He found out how to reduce the temperature of molasses below what was thought to be the theoretical limit from 250 microkelvin all the way down to 20 microkelvin. Okay, that's a big step. Cointonucci in France, who won this prize at one point, he explained the origin of cooling theoretically. Okay? Now, the 1997, three, these three guys share the Nobel Prize in Physics for development of methods to optically cool and trap atoms. Okay? A new generation of atomic physics, physicists attacked a difficult problem of achieving a phenomenon known as Bose-Einstein condensation. If, I, if atoms can be cooled to the point where they're dense enough and the temperature is low enough, so low that atoms interact strongly, then the atoms couple together and undergo a phase transition to a superfluid state, okay, known as a Bose-Einstein condensation. This is a new superfluid state of matter in which the atoms behave as a fluid, okay, that can flow without damping. It just flows so long as it stays cold. To achieve this state, one needs to decrease the temperature from that 20 degrees Kelvin by a factor of 2,000 more down to something like 2 nano Kelvin, okay. Atoms at such a temperature are by far the coldest atoms in the universe. There's nothing colder than that out there. In such a condensate, all the atoms behave identically, just like, the, like one, if you have a, many millions, they all behave alike, and, and they are in the lowest energy state of the trap. Now, condensation was achieved in about 1997, I believe, and the technique by cooling was called evaporative cooling, in which the hottest atoms in the trap were boiled off. Then you wait for the stuff to cool down a little bit, uh, to, to thermalize, and you, then you take the hot, the hot ones off again. And they escape from the trap and they cool the remaining atoms. It's like cooling a cup of coffee by evaporative cooling. Now, Cornell of, and Wyman of, of the Gila Labs in, in uh, Colorado and, and Ketterly of MIT won a second Nobel Prize in 2001 for the achievement of Bose-Einstein condensation in atomic vapors. Now this is not a solid, this is just a little gas of very, very cold atoms. Okay, now crude atomic lasers have been made which, <coughs> in which all the atoms of a beam are in phase. This is an, an analogy uh, to the coherent light of an optical uh, laser beam, okay? But this is atoms in vacuum, okay? Attempts are being made to improve uh, atom lasers and make them run continuously. The, the, the crude ones are just sort of pulsed. They, they drain the atoms off and it's gone. Now this would be a major achievement. It probably ha will happen. Uh, 
in this, in this coming century, probably within years, okay. Now, the Bose condensates produced from atomic vapors are very much purer than the previously observed condensates in liquid helium, okay? And they provide what people call an unprecedented tool for studying basic quantum mechanics in atoms. Now, the trapping of biological particles, that occurred as a result of a fortunate accident. It's just in 1987, while studying tweezer trapping of submicron particles, these are teeny ones, in water, it happened, we happened to leave the sample open to air overnight, okay? We came back the next day, and the cell had become contaminated by swimming bacteria. Not only were they were they bacteria swimming around, when they came close to the focus of the vein, they got caught. And you could see this wild scattering as the, as the atoms, as, as, the, as the bacteria stayed in the trap. They lived for a, sh for a short time, and if we turned up the power, they simply exploded. We call that optocution, okay? <laughs> we discovered, however, that if you switch the, the laser to an infrared laser, so-called YAG laser, and took bacteria such as E. coli, very common bacteria, that you, you could not only stop, you not only, the bacteria not only stayed alive but for a long time, but after a time, an hour or so later, you look and you suddenly have two bacteria. You wait another hour, you have four bacteria. So they can't be suffering too much. They weren't being damaged by the tweezers. Then we tried all sorts of living cells, yeast cells, red blood cells, protozoa, green plant cells, scallions, you go to the supermarket, you get scallions, uh, and spirogyra, these are the things people know from high school biology. And they all stayed alive. In the case of the yeast cells, they, they would grow up to big clumps. They weren't being harmed by the light. But with bigger plant cells and protozoa, we found that you could even trap and manipulate particles or organelles, the things that were existing inside the living cell. We could do little operations with a light beam. We could pull off the chloroplasts from a spirogyra cell and attach them to, a, to the wall at another, at another place. Normally, if you take two membranes and you try to put them together, it doesn't stick. But if you hold it there with a light beam, the membranes break down and it reattaches. So you have a whole new kind of spirogyra cell. Whether that's an advantage or not, I doubt it if it is, but it's quite remarkable that that happens. And these experiments were done by us and initiated the study of uh, use of tweezers in biology. One of the major accomplishments of tweezers in biology is to study the mechanical properties of the so-called motor molecules or mechanoenzymes that drive all movement inside of cells. Biophysicists, especially uh, people like Steve Block of Stanford, have studied a whole host of uh, uh, effects. They studied the movement of mitochondria and vesicles. These are small particles along what's called the cytoskeleton of the cell. Skel cell has a, a, a structure. And the movement, that, uh, these motors drive the movement of chromosomes during uh, cell division. Propulsion of cells by flagella and the crawling motion of amoebas and bacteria over surfaces, okay? That all happens. You can study that with tweezers. Now, you can also study the movement of special molecules like uh, RNA polymerase and DNA polymerase, which crawl over, over DNA. They crawl very slowly, but with a very powerful force. And they're involved in the replication of DNA, and uh, they, these molecules have other functions that you can see, like the cor correction of errors in DNA. You can see the molecules suddenly go backwards. Why are they moving backwards? Well, there's an error, and they have to cut out the bad places, make new DNA, and then continue. All of this has been studied by Steve Block and his students. You can measure the forces that they're driving these things. It's in the piconewton range very accurately. 
can determine how these molecules get their energy from ATP, the source of energy in cells, but they, you also can get energy from the splitting of other molecules, and so you don't need ATP in certain cases, like the, the polymerases. One can even determine the efficiency of biological motors, you know? This one is 50%. Does it change when they go faster or slower, when you pull on them? These are wonderful things. Okay, but just the ability to pick up a, a, a bacterium and move it someplace else and put it where it, it's separated from the others so that you can clone it is very important because there are just millions of bacteria in the water, in earth, that nobody knows about, and especially in the hot sulfur springs of Yellowstone Park. Now, I'm approaching the end of my list here. A recent big topic with tweezers is, is optical cell sorting, okay? They're being built now, and they're thought to be, at this point, already better than what they call the present-day cell cytometry sorters. They have cell sorters. They're used in all the hospitals. You sort out bad cells from, from, from good cells. You shine a, line of, shine a laser on it, it fluoresces, it's a good one, go here, bad one, go there. Now, I want to just mention this last thing that I learned just two weeks ago from an optical journal, that optical tweezers are being used as a new tool by Indians. Indian Indians, not American Indians. And these, these authors point out that millions of people die from malaria every over, and um, millions of babies have malaria and die. But uh, there's a desperate need for a technique for early diagnosis of this disease. And they have found one using optical tweezers. What they, what they do, they say, if you have a single beam, you attract a blood cell, okay? If it's healthy, it's very pliable, and it changes its shape. And what happens is that the cell begins to spin in, in the trap. But if the cell is rigid, it doesn't change its shape very much, and it stays still. So that's a clear distinction. Now that's for one trap, but with uh, techniques have called uh, uh, optical, optical holography, and with modulators, you can make thousands of traps at one time. See which ones are good, which ones are bad. You can change the laser power, all the bad ones go away, all the good ones stay, okay? So this is, uh, I think, gonna be uh, a very important thing for, um, for, for medicine, actually. Well, all these fields are growing rapidly. The cell sorting community, they just had a symposium, and uh, the organizer told me he got, uh, he got well over 100 papers, which was a great surprise. In, uh, in uh, Bose condensates, the number of papers is thousands every year. They have, they have done a, a new trick. We, so I was talking about Bose condensates. All, particles, all, kinds of part, all particles are divided into two classes. There's Bose particles and Fermi particles, which have different atomic spins. But the point is that they've trapped the fermions, and they've made, fermions don't like to interfere, but they've made Bose, uh, Bose condensates from, uh, they've made condensates of fermions by cooling them with, with Bose particles. Of course, they're not identical, they can collide. Now that's another big thing, and uh, what happens in that case is that instead of getting superfluidity, you can get the same process of, of, uh, of condensation uh, gives you superconductivity. So these people think that the high temperature superconductors now, which are getting close to room temperature, <coughs> might be understood. They still don't understand it. And if they do, they could possibly make a room temperature superconductor. Now, wouldn't that be fabulous? That would solve a good part of our energy uh, crisis, okay? So on these two wonderful uh, uh, recent discoveries, I think I'll quit. Thank you very much for listening.